sincere congratulations to all the awardees uh, that were uh, receiving recognition uh, for this. Uh, let me start with the words that uh, the minister was making, and that is that the Green Deal is, in fact, a economic policy. And an economic policy that needs to be translated into its industrial dimension, its financial dimension, but geared through policymaking, and in particular to carbon pricing. I think that's a very important message that the minister said she would take uh, forward in during the incoming German uh, presidency. Now that is, is exactly the theme of today's discussion. And um, I think uh, we have very distinguished speakers. Um, we have today Alexander Stupp. Alexander Stupp was a prime minister of Finland. He was in banking uh, at the EIB and he is now at the EUI in Florence, heading the School of Transnational Governance. And together with Peter Viss, he is going to give the introduction uh, to uh, this uh, debate today. I'm going to co-chair this together with Simone Borghesi, uh, who is also online. And so we are going to alternate in introducing the uh, interventions by the POC members, and they are going to make their interventions in alphabetical order. So if Alexander Stupp is now online, May I invite uh, Alexander uh, to uh, make his opening comments? Thank you very much, Jos, and I, I, I sure am uh, online. And uh, a warm greeting from um, Helsinki, where, as custom has it, we have plus 30 degrees and the sun is uh, shining. Um, it's a great honor to be here today, and I have been asked to give a political overview of uh, how I see uh, COVID-19. Uh, and I'll, I'll do that by giving you an introduction, uh, three points uh, and a conclusion in my allotted uh, 15 minutes. By way of introduction, let me say that in these types of crises, COVID-19, we have a tendency as human beings to over-rationalize the past, in other words, use examples from the past, over-dramatize the present, in other words, think that this is an extraordinary circumstance, and then thirdly, underestimate the future. Uh, so I will do all of those things. I will over-rationalize the past, over-dramatize the present, and hopefully not underestimate the future. If you look at it purely from a climatic perspective, I think we should try to draw as many lessons as possible from what is going on right now, because I think the big storm is looming. Uh, and I think in many ways we should be using COVID-19 um, as an example, and in many ways as an excuse uh, to push the climate agenda uh, even further. My three points are the following. First, how will member states and countries be judged uh, on COVID-19? What are the criteria? Second, what are the consequences of this crisis? And thirdly, what is the outcome? All of this before uh, the concluding remarks. I think there are actually three criteria, point number one, uh, that uh, countries and regions will be judged upon um, uh, in the aftermath uh, of this crisis. Criteria number one is very morbid uh, and in many ways also, of course, tragic. That is the death toll. How well were you able to contain the virus? How many people got infected? And at the end of the day, how many died? Of course, here the figures are not compatible and in some cases not trustworthy either, but that debate will take place. Number two, how will the economy bounce back? And what kind of an economy will bounce back? Um, and here, I think uh, all of us uh, are in many ways at the loss and second guessing. I'm just fresh out of a European Business Leaders Convention where Christine Lagarde uh, spoke over Zoom and gave her analysis of what the economy could look like. And I will use some of the words that she used as, as well. And then number three is, how well do you communicate this crisis? 
because don't forget this is also a communications exercise. I'll just give you one example. The European Union puts out a five pillar recovery plan, including the ECB, the EIB, the Commission, the ESM, uh, and the so-called uh, recovery instrument. It's roughly three trillion euros. China sends one, one airplane of masks to Italy. What do they sing or listen to on the balconies of Italian houses? Beethoven's Ode to Joy or the Chinese National Anthem? So I'm trying to say is that whatever happens, this is a huge communications exercise uh, as well. So these are the criteria, death toll, bounce back of the economy and communication. What are the consequences of COVID-19? Uh, uh, my second point. Uh, I will give you three broad consequences. One is the economy, two is politics, and three is global. On the economy, and here I am paraphrasing what I just heard from Christine Lagarde, this crisis is sequential. So basically we'll bounce back in geographic order going from east to west, where it first began uh, and where it last landed. Secondly, it's extremely complicated. You know, I don't want to over dramatize, but this has very little to do with a financial crisis which I was dealing with as foreign minister, finance minister, and prime minister post-2008. This is completely different. You can't push austerity in this particular case. All of us really have to become uh, Keynesian. Number three, it's uncertain. Number four, it hits us unevenly, both inside the European Union uh, and globally. And number five, and this is important, I think it's transformational. I don't know what kind of future economies we're gonna have in the West, more particularly um, uh, here in Europe. You know, is it gonna be a Japanese style? Uh, you know, whatever happens, you know, we are gonna be in a situation where we will have low interest rates and low growth rates for the for foreseeable future. And the question is, how are central banks going to deal with this? What is the monetary policy going to be like? And what kind of fiscal policies will uh, states uh, basically use? So this is a game changer uh, without being overly dramatic. Secondly, what are the political consequences? And here, of course, I'll have to look at both democracies and authoritarian states. I think in Europe, we'll continue the megatrend of very messy election results, very fragmented uh, election results, where we see sort of a decay of traditional political parties, such as the one perhaps I have been represented, uh, representing for, for 14 years. You have these sort of new entrepreneurial parties coming in and basically movements. And I'll just throw this out as well. I have an 18-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old son. I just simply cannot see them joining any kind of a party any time during their life. Instead, they're very much into different types of movements. It can be the climate movement, it can be the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, uh, it, it can be any type of a movement as such. So this will mean that in Europe we'll see an increase of fragmentation of, of democratic um, uh, politics uh, from these sort of challenger parties. A uh, sort of final and third point on the political implications. I think we're in for a very interesting debate about what I would call surveillance and freedom. Uh, and as we know, if data is the new gold, I don't want to use in this crowd, data is the new oil because data is a little bit cleaner than oil. Um, it's transparent, it's like water and, and, and the rest of it. Uh, but the bottom line here is that, that you know, there are going to be fundamental issues uh, about um, freedom and surveillance, uh, about security uh, and liberty that we will be dealing with politically, both here in Europe uh, and uh, elsewhere. My third and final consequence, apart from the economic and political, is a global one. I personally believe that we will see three power centers emerging from this crisis globally. One is China, for rather obvious reasons. Um, size of the economy, um, regional clout in Asia, 
uh, and uh, beyond. May I just say a fair word of warning here? China is not going to become a traditional democratic Western style governance system. It simply ain't going to happen. The mentality is completely different. So whether we like it or not, and I don't like it, forget it. It's not going to become a democracy. It's going to be a different type of a power. The second power center is the United States, which of course has been struggling uh, with the current president for the past four years and has certainly made one of the, you know, in the terms of Paul Kennedy, uh, greatest, uh, you know, sort of demises of power from a great power to a small state. And you could call it marginally or voluntary marginalization. Um, I think things will be different in the US, obviously, if uh, Joe Biden is elected, but it's not going to be the same. You know, we're not going to see an America which is as engaged in world politics or global politics as it used to be. And certainly one thing is not going to change. The number one enemy of the US, regardless of which administration you have, uh, is going to be China. And the third power center, and I will qualify this later on, I think is Europe and the European Union. I actually think the European Union has dealt with this crisis extremely well. Yes, the first four weeks were a little bit slow and things didn't work out. But in my 14 years in European politics, I have never, ever seen the European Union with such swift action. I'll give you just one example. ESM took four years. The five pillar package that we have now took basically four weeks. Europe acted on this. And isn't it in many ways as a pro-European wonderful to see how little screaming, shouting and criticism there is of the European reaction right now. It's sort of almost like, oh, well, okay, they're doing it, I guess. Uh, what is then point number three, the outcome of this? Again, I come back to the three themes. I think number one, there will be a change in economic governance. The way in which we do fiscal policies back home and the way in which monetary policies is driven. We don't know you know, what the debt burdens are going to be. We don't know and whether states will be a ever able to pay back the debts. We're talking about, you know, 30, <coughs> 40, 50 year maturities uh, as such, but it will change. Another thing that changes in the economy is the notion of state versus market. Uh, at, uh, in our Florence Live conversations, we had a wonderful seminar on this as well. And the basic thesis I have is that in 1989, the end of the Cold War, it was all about market. It was about market liberalization, the four freedoms, um, the reconstruction of Eastern and Western European economies, the death of communism, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. But now we're coming to the point where people realize, well, markets can't take care of everything. It started in 2008 with the financial crisis. That's when the pendulum swung back towards the state. Uh, and I think COVID-19 or COVID-19 will swing it a little bit further. How far it goes, I don't know. When will it do a comeback? I don't know. But in the economic governance of things, there will be less free market, more state intervention. Second outcome is a change in politi political governance. I mentioned the word fragmentation earlier, but for us in democratic societies, uh, I have a very simple thesis. I think Kahneman's book, Think Slow, Think Fast, Brain System One, Quick, Emotional, Reactive, System Two, Slow, Rational, Compromise Based, is very prevalent to liberal democracy today. Liberal democracy, as defined by John Locke, Montesquieu, Rousseau, modern liberal democracy, was created for system two. It was supposed to be slow, messy, cumbersome, and looking for compromises. But we live in a system one world, whereby anyone who is in a democracy, or even in an authoritarian system as such, needs to react extremely swiftly. So unless we do this change in democratic governance, I think democracy uh, will, will suffer. We are seeing fragmented politics um, uh, already. Uh, finally, a change in global governance. I think it'll do two things. It'll change the notion of geopolitics. 
Uh, and in Europe, we must understand that geopolitics is not anymore only about hard security. It's also about the, econo uh, the economy. So trade wars are part of geopolitics um, as well. And if I was a really shrewd operator in between China and the US at the moment, I would use this uh, opportunity to play geopolitics. I hate to say this as, as an avid transatlanticist and someone who believes in values, but basically the European Union needs to be a little bit like Finland during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. You need to show that your values are with the, Amer with the Americans and the West, but you kind of need to play ball with China as well and realize that it's a superpower. I'm sorry to say this so bluntly. I can do this nowadays that I'm on the academic side of the fence, not the political side of the fence, because this would probably be a scandal. But I, I think that's what Europe should, should do. I actually think the multilateralism might strengthen at the end of the day because of this crisis. And here's where I come to my conclusion so that I stick to my uh, allotted time. Number one, this is a significant crisis, but it's not uh, catastrophic. Number two, uh, it will basically be looking at resilience to change, how you can cope with this. And number three, I think that the societies that can manage this crisis the best are those which have strong welfare systems. And therefore, I think that Europe will actually come out of this quite well. And I'll finish off by saying that I think the commission actually got it absolutely right, even before the COVID crisis. They have three basic priorities as they have outlined it. Number one, geopolitics. Number two, climate. And number three, technology. To be honest, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to, for Europe to drive the climate agenda, to drive the tech agenda and get geopolitical. As an added bonus, they just got the biggest MFF multi-financial framework that they could ever envisage. So I think we'll get out of this. This is my optimistic political assessment of the situation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. And thank you very much for your very rich vision in which you are in de facto mapping out the scope of your new role as the director of the School of Transnational Governance. Because where is Europe vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States that is retreating vis-a-vis -vis China that is uh, coming up with its own rules and, 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 and days and ways of uh, managing things. But what I would strongly agree with is that uh, your assertion that Europe did in fact pretty well in the current crisis because perhaps the European institutions, and it's not only the Commission, but all the European institutions learned a lot from how they have to avoid the number of mistakes they made following the banking crisis. And I think that's a, a very rich way of uh, putting things into perspective. Thanks, thanks very much, Alexander. I hand over to Simone, who will introduce the next speaker. Simone. Thank you, Jos. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter. Uh, I move from one marathon runner, Alex, to uh, the marathon of the negotiations or the work of the European Commission, Peter, because Peter has worked for over uh, 30 years uh, with the European Commission, has, had, has been head of cabinet for the Environmental Commissioner for Climate Action, uh, uh, Connie Hedegaard has worked with Andres Pibals, the European Commissioner for Energy. So he has a long expertise uh, in the, the European Commission work. And I would like to uh, give him the floor and uh, have his perspective uh, on the situation right now. Okay? It can complement or opposite the one of Alex. I really, I'm really keen on knowing your opinion uh, on these and on a bunch of other aspects like uh, border tax adjustment, to mention one, and uh, just to throw it on the floor, but I leave it to you, Peter. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Simone. Um, now, I am delighted to speak. Thank you for the invitation. Um, as you said, I spent 30 years in the European Commission. I no longer work in the European Commission, so I have also a bit of more freedom uh, to give a judgment, if you like, on what they're doing now. Now, I believe that the European Green Deal represents a very significant step change in the 
attitude of the European Commission and the European Union towards climate change. Um, climate change was where I spent most of my career. Uh, it was always a hard slog, and I might say it was particularly a hard slog during the financial crisis of 2009, 2010, um, because the situation economically was difficult and we were seen a little bit by many at, in, in the Commission and outside as nice to have, but we can't afford it now. What the Green Deal does is that it is putting the economic strategy of Europe, or well, climate change is firmly placed as a central part of the economic, and you could even say industrial strategy of Europe. Um, that is a significant change. It's no longer being looked at as an expensive luxury. What it also does, and I think this is rather hard to take, but it's a fact, the commission is changing decisions already taken with respect to the levels of ambition we were setting ourselves for 2030. We had previously agreed, we have at the moment agreed, to reduce emissions by 40% in 2030, as compared to their level in 1990. Now, um, basically what the European Green Deal is doing is it's saying, it's saying we were wrong that 40% is not enough, and that we should be much more ambitious. Um, so in effect, the whole suite of legislation that had been put in place to practically deliver 40% will now have to be reopened and strengthened, made more stringent, in order to reach a much higher percentage, whether that be 50, 55%, we will see. So in effect, the present commission is saying the previous one was wrong, and people are asking, well, why is the Commission or GG Climate Action now advocating 50, 55% when previously they were advocating 40%? And they say, well, circumstances have changed. The Paris Agreement has been agreed, for example, or technology costs have fallen. But actually, I believe it is a political decision. Uh, primarily led by the incoming president, Ursula von der Leyen, who's now, of course, uh, president of the European Commission. She was reading the, the mood of the moment. She obviously, I would say that the IPCC's 1.5 degrees centigrade report published in 2018 was significant. It alarmed people to see how bad climate could be even at 1.5%, let alone uh, 1.5 degrees, let alone at two degrees and possibly much higher. Um, there's also the school strike movement, which has obviously energized young people. Um, so that's another sort of contributing factor to why we might want to go more now. But I think there were already signs that the commission in 2018 was thinking more ambitiously. And I think the long-term strategy that was published called a Clean Planet for All Europeans uh, was already prefiguring carbon neutrality in 2050. Not carbon neutrality, climate neutrality. But I think also Ursula von der Leyen had to come into the commission and decide what was going to be her defining story. Um, I personally think, as someone of similar age to her, that she wanted to do something that her seven children would be proud of her for doing. Now, being the Defence Minister of Germany is undoubtedly a remarkable achievement for anybody, but is it going to leave a legacy of which her children and grandchildren will be proud? She knows, Ursula von der Leyen knows, like we know, where the science is. There's no doubting that. And she's looking perhaps for an area where Europe can gain advantage as a first mover. And that links up very much with what Alex Stu has just said. Plus, she's going to put the European Commission and the European Union on the right side of history. 
hopefully connecting with those younger generations and making Europe more loved because it is a fact that those of us who worked at the heart of Europe for, for a long time, we want to be loved, we want Europe to be loved. And it was very painful for myself to see my own country, United Kingdom, leave the EU. So I would say there has never been a European Commission as green as this one. The Commission is defining itself by this, 20, this European Green Deal, and its success will largely be judged on how much it delivers towards it. So, and in a way, I would say this, there was a very interesting article published yesterday in the Financial Times about the oil majors and which of them had the most ambitious climate targets. And in the end, it was any who was decided to have the most ambitious target, not because they advocate climate new, uh, neutrality in 2050, because so did BP, so did Repsol but particularly because ENI was unique in setting a 2030 target for itself. And that is the real challenge. It's not passing a climate law that says we'll be climate neutral net zero by 2050. That's too far away really for the present generation of politicians to be held accountable for. But 2030 is much closer and it requires changes now, if we're going to have any hope. So advocating a target of 50 or 55% 55 in 2030, that's where the real challenge is. That's, and von der Leyen is putting herself into a situation where she might hope perhaps for a second mandate and still be there to see fulfillment of that 2030 target. And what she's doing essentially is from where we are today to net zero in 2050, she's drawn a straight line and the straight line takes us through 55% in 2030. So she's done it a little bit simplistically in terms of uh, setting or advocating a target, possibly 55%. She's been very careful, you'll have noticed, to keep referring to 50 or 55, depending on the impact assessment work. Of course, we all hope that the impact assessment work is good, and I expect members of ERARE to uh, say if you think there's been foul play when that impact assessment is published and whether it's a case of reverse engineering, um, but I think it's going to be a solid piece of work and it, these, parts, these pieces of work can be incredibly uh, important. So remember, of course, it's net zero and it's not absolute zero. There's a huge difference. And so we're more or less accepting that there will be emissions in 2050. But there will also be an equivalent number of removals. And I think too much conversation has been had so far about reductions of emissions. And that's normal, I think. But we should increasingly be talking about removals. And it's very encouraging to see that the Circular Economy Action Plan that the Commission has published this year includes the objective of by 2023, putting in place a regulatory framework for the certification of CO2 removals. That is announced. So certified removals would then need to cover the residual emissions. And one could imagine there being a market uh, established or uh, developed that would, if you like, uh, match emissions with those removals. And perhaps I therefore foresee not just an amendment of the ETS, of the emissions trading system next year to increase its scope, as indeed is promised, um, because it's, it's already said in the European Green Deal that the emissions trading system will be extended to maritime emissions and it will consider the inclusion of buildings and road transport. Those are extensions of scope. Um, but I think there will need to be uh, in the next five or 10 years, a further change that will integrate uh, carbon removals that have been certified and, and I think this, therefore, is an instrument which is extremely important. It's often described as a flagship instrument of the European Union. 
but it's also one whose evolution has not stopped. It's got to evolve in the future. So where does, where does the COVID uh, crisis impact on, on this? Well, of course, it proves one thing. It proves one thing that, that the best laid plans can quickly be thrown by surprises. Uh, it reminds me of the, the Marischal von Moltes speaking, uh, spe uh, citation, uh, the Prussian general who said that plans, military plans, uh, only survive the f until the first contact with the enemy. In other words, you know, you've got to be ready to adjust. And I think, of course, what the COVID will do is it will make um, the economy worse. It'll have a big economic impact. And it is worrying to see that because in history, European Union business has generally been better at, in good times and has gone less well in bad times. But it's sometimes out of the bad times that seeds are sown for remarkable changes and steps forward. And I think there too, this latest um, financial recovery package that the Commission has put onto the table at the European level, coupled with its amendment to the European Union's next uh, EU budget for the seven year period 2021 to 2027, the two together make an enormous uh, 1.85 trillion euros um, the budget itself is staying, if the Commission's proposal is to be uh, followed, it would stay bigger even than it was before. And that is notwithstanding the fact that the United Kingdom has left the EU and they used to contribute 12% towards the EU budget. So that we're moving up a larger figure with fewer member states is, I think, all the more remarkable. And you know, and we will discuss, I think, in the panel session that follows, you know, how green that recovery plan is. I mean, there's lots of talk about the just transition. I think that is important. It shows that we're aware of fairness criteria. It's become mainstream. We have to think of sectors or populations that are adversely impacted by the policy changes that arise as a result of our climate transition. Um, we've got, obviously, I think the CAP reform, the common agricultural policy, we keep talking about it, but I think nature-based solutions are beginning to be seen more positively. Uh, and indeed, the Commission's recent farm to fork strategy puts squarely on the table the concept of carbon farming. Those are interesting developments. And the recovery package actually put a little bit more money into agroecology measures under the common agricultural policy. And the 750 billion euros, of course, that the European Union is going to start borrowing, that is itself a remarkable innovation. It's usually the EU budget is a budget whereby the money paid in year is equal to the money contributions that the member states make. So to change and use borrowing is increasing the capacity for EU funding over the next seven years. And I think we can say that these will be seven years of plenty in EU funding terms. And 25% of EU funds are to be climate related. And this principle will apply to all of the EU funding. We've got the EU taxonomy uh, that will be increasingly steering investment decisions made by the European Union, but equally by the member states and the European Investment Bank. Um, we've got the national energy and climate plans that the recovery plans that the member states have got to now develop must be consistent with. So things are joined up and I think we can hope to see a very green uh, a greener recovery than we saw in the last financial crisis. It's essential indeed. And this is a debate that's going on widely. But I was rather, um, I mean, there are still skeptics. There's still people like the CEO of Ryanair, Michael O'Leary, um, who, who believes, and I quote him, 
He says, I suspect an awful lot of the environmental agenda and targets will be put on the back burner for a number of years. That's what he says. Um, I hope that isn't the case. Uh, it shouldn't be the case. Um, and a columnist in the Financial Times, Pilate Clark, has cited, among other figures, that renewable energy companies employed 11 million people globally at the end of 2018, an increase from about three and a half million in 2010. This is data that's uh, very produced by IRENA, but it's just to say that the understanding of the jobs that can be created, the investments that can be greened, and the technological, the technological advantage that might give you, that give Europe, then we're really talking about perhaps a change of mindset where, as Alex Stu was saying earlier, Europe might actually be trying to play to the strengths that it's got and in the global context uh, have more clout um, as a result and indeed perhaps uh, help leadership uh, in terms of climate because we know we can't solve the climate problem ourselves but we can be an excellent uh, example of best practice both in policy terms and of course in technology terms as well um, so there we are I, I leave it there and i don't talk about the border adjustment mechanism um, but we can come back to that another time, I think, Simone, if you don't mind. Actually, it was a provocation, <laughs> but because I want to uh, push the debate uh, for later on. But uh, uh, thanks a lot, Peter, for your historical perspective that shows us actually where the targets came from, where we are going, how we can go there, and the importance of the intermediate steps and the importance of change, the mindset, as you said, if we want to achieve, and we can achieve, a green uh, recovery and green jobs. So I pass on to Jos now uh, to uh, introduce the panel discussion. Thank you, thank you Simone. And uh, so we have uh, all the members of the POC committee who are going to make a two, three minutes intervention on a REACH menu that was set out by Alex and Peter. Uh, I think we uh, have the boundaries of the Green Deal uh, we have the boundaries of the, of the COVID crisis and we have the geopolitical challenges that I think uh, Alex was putting into perspective. So with that, with that, I would like to give the floor to the POC members in alphabetical order. And uh, we will start with Dominique Bureau from France. Uh, he is the general delegate of the Economic Council of the French Minister of Ecology and he chairs the Green Tax Commission. And I think Dominique is uh, very well placed uh, to give us a perspective on what he thinks the possible role of green taxation is going to be, in particular, because uh, this green taxation has some distributional effects. And the uh, Gilets Jaunes, Dominique, were coming from France. They were very active in Paris. So uh, that perspective, uh, I think, is very important for our discussion. Dominique, up to you. Jos, can I abuse my position yeah, as the first speaker and yeah. just throw out to the panelists, disrupt a little bit. Could you please answer the question, which way and why or both is going to get out of us out of the climate cha uh, challenge? Is it going to be targets and regulation or is it going to be technological innovation? or both? Which would you put in the scale? That's a very good perspective added to you, Dominique. <laughs> you have the floor. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, perhaps I, uh, I will begin by the, the question about the risk of yellow vest uh, going European. Indeed, I think that uh, uh, we have said that climate policy was an economic policy. Uh, we must have in mind mind that uh, carbon pricing is a, is a technological policy also. Uh, of course, I hope that um, there will not be a yellow vest in Europe. But last year, we did not imagine that uh, under the pressure of, of car users, the French government will back, would backtrack the carbon tax increase that had been planned. So it is obviously important to ensure that the ETS reform or energy taxation reform will not suffer the same fate. How not to miss the unique opportunity of the European Green, Green Deal? 
I would say by not making the two related mistakes that France did. One, neglecting, neglecting adverse distributional effects of climate policies. And I would say climate policies, not only carbon pricing, indeed, I think that uh, standards uh, also have uh, potential adverse distributional effects. So we must be careful to, to tackle distributional effects. And second, we must, uh, the second mistake was to, to, to implement eco taxes more to get money than for uh, incentive reasons, thinking that carbon taxes were good Colbertian tools allowing to plug the goose without crash. Indeed, French riots have shown how much this was wrong. The good news is that the economic solution for the distributional problem is well known, returning a significant part of the tax for lump sum transfers. However, a lesson of different micro modeling was that the amount to be redistributed to be fair was higher than expected due to heterogeneity of households. So, a bad news follows. Since one euro can be spent only one time, and since a significant part of revenues must be returned, carbon rates should not be seen as a budgetary resource. Policymakers must be cautious when deviating from this principle, even for financing green expenditure. They also may be cautious with the idea that the cost of alternative instruments can be indefinitely hidden. The last episode of the Yellow Vest story is interesting in this respect. Uh, perhaps you know that the panel of citizens, citizens that should propose alternative approaches for carbon neutrality is first, has completed this work. The result is a list of 150 measures, potentially very costly, so that the public debate about climate policy is again controversial today. And finally, I think that if you want to avoid a Yellow Vest risk, what is important is to show the public how carbon neutrality can be achieved at reasonable costs and how, by all the instruments, but uh, we, must, we must show how. Thus, I think that sound, understandable cost-benefit analysis would help to avoid the risk of yellow vest. And more immediately, the risk that the economic and emergency crowds out the ecological one. For this transparency, perhaps uh, an idea that would be that the union decide a common social cost of carbon to be applied to all policy reviews, to all policy uh, assessments, technological, taxes, uh, other instruments, at the agenda of our wanted Green Deal. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dominique. Thanks a lot for your view from, from the French perspective also. And I would like to move now to the German perspective, uh, following the order uh, asking Otmar, uh, Otmar Edenhofer to um, give us his views on, uh, I would propose said German perspective because I know that Otmar is very much involved into the German debate on the parallel emission trading system on extension of the ETS. And so I would like to know his opinion on this and also on the German presidency that is going to start and what the implications might be on climate and energy perspectives. Otmar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a great honor to participate in, in this uh, great panel. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, perfect. Oh, okay, good, wonderful, because I got the difference. Now, um, before I, I go a little bit into the German debate, let me highlight one important thing. And this is that, in fact, I'm very much in favor of the European Green Deal. I'm excited about this, and I'm particularly excited that Europe has taken the approach to uh, focus on climate and technology and on geopolitics. But we should, I would like to remind us at this stage that the climate problem is indeed a global problem. And fundamentally for the next few years, it's an issue of coal. And now there are two narratives around the globe. The first narrative tells us that coal will never recover after the COVID crisis. Uh, coal will basically will be phased out around the globe. 
And this problem will be solved, so to say, by technology and markets fundamentally alone. This is narrative number one. It might be the case that some of the international institutions promoting this uh, paradigm are on the right track. But here I would like to remind us that this is a ris an extremely risky option. If you look at China, China basically decided to bring a lot of coal-fired plants back into the pipeline. In 2020, they planned more new coal-fired plants in the year than uh, of, compared to 2019. Why is this the case? Here I would bring on the table two important reasons. The first one is capital costs. The capital costs in Asia are quite high, and even for smaller countries like Bangladesh, like the Philippines, like Vietnam, and like Indonesia, because of the high capital costs, coal-fired plants are still competitive compared to renewables because of this high capital costs and the low CO2 prices. And there's an additional factor here that most of these countries believe that the fiscal multiplier of coal-fired plants is quite high, so then you, if you invest one dollar or one euro into a coal-fired plant, you can increase uh, the economy-wide uh, income more uh, than uh, you get more than one dollar or one euro back. High fiscal multiplier, high capital costs, and low carbon prices are, from my point of view, a very crucial aspect. And if you calculate the coal-fired plants, which are now uh, in operation, which are planned, and which could come back into the pipeline. So this adds up uh, to a global carbon budget, which basically uh, uh, exhausts the whole uh, available uh, uh, CO2 budget for the 1.5 degree target. And even so, not too much room is left uh, for other sectors, even to limit the increase of uh, global mean temperature around two degrees. So this is something which is quite important when we talk in Europe about the European Green Deal, that we should not forget what's going on outside Europe. And therefore, I would suggest that we think also in this panel here on, on policy measures which, could, uh, which we could offer to, in particular to the coal dependent countries, first to reduce the capital costs, to incentivize the increase of, of CO2, and also to find other measures with high fiscal multipliers. So what we could do, for example, we could uh, uh, analyze the policy of the multilateral, de multilateral development banks. They should subsidize their credits. Subsidized credits could help to reduce the capital costs. So in exchange of this, we could ask these uh, countries uh, to increase their carbon pricing schemes and also uh, to, to, to rethink their fiscal rescue packages. I think that's, that's quite important. And this uh, issue cannot be uh, substituted by border adjustment mechanisms and so on, because I think Europe should really think hard uh, to enhance international cooperation, at least on the coal issue, which is in the next five years a real pressing issue. And all the coal-fired plants which are now in the pipeline will build up so this will make international climate policy extremely, extremely difficult and costly. Now, my last, uh, my last uh, uh, comment on, on, the, on the German situation and on the presidency. I think uh, Germany is, is very much committed to make the Green Deal to a success. Germany is also quite committed to promote carbon pricing as one of the most important uh, policy tools. And, uh, uh, in order to answer uh, Alexander Stubb's question, so what, what would you put on the table? I would say it's technology plus carbon pricing. But carbon pricing is essential and technology is es essential, and you cannot substitute uh, one uh, thing with the other. So technologies and carbon pricing is crucial. And this was the reason why Chen implemented a carbon pricing scheme, an emissions trading scheme uh, for all the sectors out there, the UETS. It's not perfect. So you might think this is not the, the right way, but this is due to domestic uh, policy circumstances. But at least we have now a carbon price almost in all the sectors. And I'm quite uh, convinced that Germany will uh, use uh, the, the presidency uh, to, to push uh, carbon pricing plus innovation plus technology further. 
So I think uh, I have exhausted my time budget and I will stop here. Thank you very much, Otmar. Uh, thank you very much uh, for replying to Alexander's question because basically what you are doing is putting a lot of emphasis on measures, policies, such as carbon pricing, to drive into the market technology. And I think that nexus is, turns out to be much more important than a endless debate that we risk having again on setting new targets. And I think that, that is putting the right uh, perspective I think I would like to have. I haven't said that targets are not important, but uh, if you have to weigh up the scarce political capital, I think that uh, putting the emphasis on measures and on technology is perhaps uh, the most important way to go. And thank you also for underlining the coal issue. And uh, you are absolutely right to say this is a global issue. Uh, with the EUI in the School of Transnational Governance, we did training in South Africa, who, has, uh, who is a very helpful country in the international negotiations, but is up to 98% a coal-driven economy. We, uh, we have a huge transition to make there. So Asia, Africa, and Latin America, coal is still a major issue. Thank you, Otmar. The next uh, intervention is from Ben Groom. And Ben Groom is from the London School of Economics and Political Science. And Ben is going uh, to address the issue of the social dimension and the just transition that is also coming up as a major element in the European debate. So Ben, you have the floor. You, uh, you can hear me now, right? Yeah, we hear you now. now Great, go fantastic. Ahead. Yeah. Um, well, thanks very much for this opportunity and thank you also for the uh, interventions of the previous speakers. Um, very interesting stuff. Um, what I want to say is the following. Uh, obviously, post-COVID, the, the, if we think about fairness uh, as being in terms of like income distributions, well-being distributions, unemployment is going to be a key issue in terms of uh, outcomes here. So the Green Deal uh, is, is it, it should be orientated towards that. A recent report by Hepburn, Cameron Hepburn, uh, Nick Stern, Joe Stiglitz in the UK uh, has, has surveyed a bunch of different academics on this issue and other people in the, in the industries and shown that the green investments actually have a much bigger effect on employment than, than many other alternatives. Renewables, retrofitting, and in some cases, clean R&D. So the, the idea, as they call it, building back better has these important uh, elements of uh, fairness, I suppose, to them. And, and they have better rates of return too, so it comes at a sort of lower, lower cost. Uh, thinking about it more broadly in terms of uh, fairness, um, you know, one could also think that the sort of green policies have automatically solved some inequality issues. Um, the distribution of environmental quality is known to be unequal uh, along the lines of income distributions. And so improving environmental outcomes through air pollution policies or, or some such like uh, will address some of those issues of, of well-being inequality also. Um, if one looks at the income distribution of factors in inequality um, in terms of it, um, air quality and well-being and so on, uh, the income distribution looks even worse. So, so on that side, uh, the, the Green Deal uh, could be having some fair uh, impacts which are also fair. Um, a good example of that kind of dynamic element of, of fairness here is in terms of uh, the effect of pollution on, say, educational outcomes. Some of my colleagues, Sefi Roth at the LSE has done work on this. High levels of pollution, low levels of attainment lead to low levels of wages and, and so on later on. So it feeds into inequality. Uh, so that's an, interest, that's an interesting dimension. Lots of different examples there. Christopher Timmins, Lala Ma, Spencer Banzaf have a paper looking at uh, the location of hazardous waste sites and so on and the effect that that has had. So, um, so it could have a positive effect on, on, on the things that we're concerned about, distributional effect. The key is like, how do we make sure that that happens? And, and as economists, environmental economists, there's sort of two areas there. Um, there's uh, the cost benefit analysis is one area. We can pay more attention to inequality uh, how we deal with inequality in uh, distributional analysis and cost benefit analysis. And we look at, um, uh, we also need higher level measures of performance, not just GDP per capita, but also inequality measures as well. In the UK, we have um, an interesting situation going on whereby the cost benefit guidelines are actually being blamed for the 
disparity between the north and the south, which has been one of the key political features in the in the landscape in the UK. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, is that the use of willingness to pay tends to orientate, it is argued, um, investments and policy changes towards richer areas. And this, I think, is an area that us as economists need to address uh, quite quite carefully. So key, key issues, performance at, um, measures at the high level on inequality, procedural issues in terms of CBA, and, and also uh, uh, making sure that the rights, if we're going to engage in a political cosy and bargain in relation to environmental policy, and making sure that the rights to, say, housing or you know, um, where, where we're going to live are allocated fairly in the first place to allow that cosy bargain to play out. That's my intervention. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for bringing inequality on the ground, very important issue, and also for reminding of the interesting works that have been published very recently. Uh, Cameron, by the way, wanted to be here uh, today, but he couldn't. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I was in contact with him about this, and we appreciate the work that he has been doing in these uh, few weeks. Um, I think it's time to pass to Phoebe now. And uh, uh, by the way, I have to apologize with Otmar because I forgot to introduce you. But you know, uh, I'm so used to <laughs> exchanging emails with you, and uh, it's it's you are so well known that I simply didn't say anything. But uh, as you know, he is the director of PIK and the founding uh, director of the Mercator and professor uh, uh, in Berlin. Uh, Phoebe. Phoebe is at the Athens University of Economics and Business. Uh, she's the president-elect of, of our association. And she's also very active uh, uh, with uh, Jeffrey Sachs on the sustainable development goals. And I would like to invite you, Phoebe, to give, you, give us uh, your perspective exactly from this viewpoint. Uh, uh, for instance, the developing transformation pathways for the implementation on the European Green Deal. Give the Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you for having me in this panel. It's a great company to be with. Uh, I would like to mention very briefly in my three minutes the European Green Deal Senior Working Group. Uh, this is under the auspices of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and I lead it with uh, Professor Jeff, uh, Jeff Sachs at Columbia University. And uh, the working group is composed of very high level academics from uh, universities around the globe, but also international organizations like the International uh, Energy Agency. What we do in this particular working group, we develop pathways of technological and policy innovations for the joint achievement of the European Green Deal and the SDGs that are consistent uh, if you look into them in detail. And at the same time, we develop respective portfolios of financial instruments that are consistent with the European Green Deal budget, the EU recovery plan, the European semester process, and the multi-annual financial framework. So Peter put everything together, made the puzzle, um, constructed the, uh, the puzzle of these different policies and the different instruments and final, uh, funding sources that can support these policies. And basically, this is what we try to do, what Peter, uh, Peter suggested in his uh, very thoughtful uh, keynote speech. Uh, explicit objectives, we identify, them, identify and promote technological and policy pathways for decarbonization in 2015 within and across the EU states, identify and promote adaptation pathways, identify socially inclusive pathways that leave no one behind, addressing issues like the issues Ben addressed, and provide strategic recommendations and mobilize experts at country level and EU level for the ongoing implementation of the European Green Deal. This initiative is also heavily supported by another initiative, again, under uh, the auspices 
of the United Nations and in collaboration with the prestigious uh, Lancet uh, Journal and uh, the Earth Institute at Columbia University. This is the new Lancet Commission on COVID-19. Um, I participate among many other experts, uh, global leaders uh, that uh, uh, focuses on promoting best practices in the control of the pandemic, the social protection of basic needs and the recovery of the global economy. This is a truly multidisciplinary group that engages experts from public health, virology, economics, finance, business, civil society, and those from all the regions in the world. Now, these uh, two initiatives are joining forces, and in particular, if you, we want to follow our methodology, which I cannot uh, in any way detail in these three minutes, but basically we map European Green Deal objectives into SDGs and the targets and the indicators of the SDGs. And then using the SDGs index and dashboard together with the country specific performance and recommendations of the European semester, we identify where progress is needed per country and we develop country specific technology and policy pathways and the respective portfolios of uh, financial instruments that can support these pathways by taking into account, once again, I repeat, the budget of the European Green Deal, the European Recovery Plan that en enlarges and forces the European Green Deal, the European semester, and the 2021-2027 uh, uh, multi-annual financial plan framework of the European Green Deal. With regards to Prime Minister's staff, staff question, innovation, technology uh, is very important. And I think there is no choice to be made. It's not either targets or regulations or technology. Regulations are important as a top-down approach uh, uh, you all also need uh, bottom-up approaches so that you need to engage all stakeholders in co-designing the vision and the pathway towards this vision. But as far as I am concerned, my personal standing was this, is that you never introduce uh, regulations that are not supported by technological innovations. In order to regulate, and your regulation will be welcome, and it will achieve incentivizing the transition to sustainability, you really not need to have the alternative clean technology, uh, circular technology in place so that your stakeholders are not treated as sitting ducks for uh, income, for, uh, in for, for tax revenues. Your stakeholders are uh, incentivized towards the sustainable, long-run profit-making direction, and they have the option to choose that direction because you make sure that technological advancements provide the clean technology at an affordable cost. And this is exactly where I want to bring in that one important aspect of the technological innovation, in addition to energy-related innovations and digitalization-related innovations, is circular economy. The transition to circular economy that is based on principles of designing out waste and pollution and keeping products and materials in use and regenerating natural systems is a win-win situation for the European Union and for the globe because it is estimated to be able to create savings of 600 billion euros uh, for EU businesses, this is 80% of their annual turnover, create 580,000 jobs in innovative design, business models, research, recycling, remanufacturing, and product development. It is important for Europe because uh, the economy of Europe is basically an SME economy, 
and uh, circular economy is relevant for the smallest SME to the biggest enterprise. It will achieve reduction by 2050 of 56%, an estimated 56% cuts in EU emissions from heavy industry and 45% cut in global emissions from steel, cement, plastic, and aluminum products. It reduces the environmental footprint, and this is the final um, uh, close of my of my three minutes, which I'm sure are more than three minutes by now. We are currently working on a project that develops a methodology for integrating and monetizing the environmental, the financial, the economic in terms of uh, growth and job creation and social benefits from moving from the linear economy to the circular economy. At the moment, circular economy is a production process. There is no economic model behind it. And we, as environmental economists, I think, are the most well-suited economies to translate the transition from the linear to the circular economy into social benefits, monetize social benefits, because this transition produces private benefits to businesses and consumers, but also many public benefits for environmental resilience and as, uh, economic, greater economic growth and social cohesion. And this identifies the fact that because a circular economy will produce private and public benefits, the optimal model for financing the transition to circular economy is a public-private partnership. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fiva. And uh, thank you to put the emphasis on the circular economy. It uh, echoes what uh, the minister said in her opening address, that the Green Deal is an industrial, it's an economic strategy more than anything else. And also thanking, um, I would like to thank you to make the link with the European semester, because that's a very important machine of governance to integrate environmental and climate concerns into the overall economic policy. So I think that's very important. And that is what Peter Viss also underlined, is uh, basically what the EU recovery fund, as well as the European budget, is going to secure for uh, the future. So thank you, Fiebe. Uh, the next uh, uh, intervention is going to come from Xavier Labandeira. Javier is Professor of Public and Environmental Economics at the University of Vigo in Spain. And so, Javier, uh, you have been working a lot on green taxation, uh, green issues and tax reforms and things like that. Um, I think that's very important uh, to have your perspective also, because uh, Spain is uh, becoming a leader in uh, this debate as it is a leader in the Green Deal debate. So, uh, Javier, your perspective um, is very much uh, welcome and a pleasure to see you on the screen. You have the floor, Javier. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. <clears throat> and uh, let me um, give a general overview of the role of energy and environmental taxation uh, in a changing situation for European climate policy, both uh, with the European Green Deal and also with the COVID um, crisis. Um, and then I will land in Spain uh, uh, briefly. So uh, there, there, we need to change uh, uh, energy taxation at the European uh, level. Uh, it is needed to reduce inconsistencies across uh, European climate policy instruments to increase cost effectiveness and above all to increase effectiveness because uh, a sector like transport uh, is outside the EU ETS and, and needs to, to have uh, you know very strong uh, measures in order to achieve the 2030 or 2050 um, objectives. Also as Dominic said uh, we uh, have uh, distributional issues behind and, and that has have to be dealt with and also um, there is the, the role of uh, corrective uh, policy, uh, tax policy, to reinforce coming back better um, after COVID. 
So it is good to know that the Commission is planning to, to change uh, the, the directive on energy taxation um, in the next year. I mean, uh, we, we, we have to have a, we expect to have a new directive uh, proposal in 2021. Will this be feasible, uh, given the unanimity uh, rule that um, is needed uh, for, for this? Uh, we don't know. I mean, yesterday we, I, I was in a, in a webinar with lawyers uh, about this issue, and, and it is probably difficult that we brought us here. Uh, let me land uh, uh, in Spain uh, after this, because Spain has uh, shown the interest in, in waiving the, 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 the unanimity rule uh, with other big countries to progress in this area. But it is not very clear about, uh, you know, how we should do uh, some proposals that were uh, put forward by the Commission, particularly the, the taxation of kerosene given tourism. Let me share now uh, some results. I'm, 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 I'm putting uh, the, the, the document in, in the chat that we presented in the Spanish Parliament a few months ago. Uh, we were asked to produce a, a report on on, on, on environmental taxation in, in Spain for the future. And, and basically we, we presented, uh, we prioritize uh, uh, the taxation of uh, the transport sector, which is an anomalous uh, situation of Spain, very low taxation in, in the sector. And also we, we put a lot of emphasis on distributional issues. And uh, we showed that uh, it was possible to, to reduce the distributional bad impacts of this uh, taxes uh, by devoting a, a small uh, amount of, of uh, revenues and also we could use um, part of the revenues to, to reduce the poverty rate which is quite, uh, quite, quite big in Spain, quite large in Spain. So um, well, what's going to happen as, as just uh, asked, uh, we don't know, I mean Spain is very proactive, uh, the new government is, is very proactive on, on, on the European Green Deal and, and climate policies uh, within Spain, outside Spain. But in this area of taxation, I don't see progress because actually uh, the government is, is, is talking about uh, new taxes, uh, increasing some taxes, but these uh, particular energy taxes are not being mentioned. And, and this would be a mistake from my point of view and also because we need to reinforce the coming back better in Spain. Uh, actually, some of the um, um, return uh, uh, programs are, are going to, to, to favor, uh, you know, to, to, to buy uh, diesel cars or, or gasoline cars, not only electric cars. And so we need to, to increase uh, taxation. And that's uh, all for me. Thank you, Xavier. Thank you for your perspective from, from Spain. Actually, it was also broader, uh, the perspective on taxation and uh, on the challenges the important challenges that taxation has uh, right now to face. And if Aldo is there, because I'm not sure I can see him right, uh, uh, I would like to pass on to him because from taxation maybe to subsidies, where, which is a field that in which he's uh, extremely expert. Aldo is, uh, uh, well, as you know, uh, is the, um, the uh, chief economist at the Italian Ministry of the Environment is also uh, involved uh, uh, actively, uh, involved many years in the OECD activities, and is professor at the University of Rome Tor Vergata. Aldo, in your long experience, you have worked on policies and subsidies, and I'd like to know how would you see them being designed to achieve the targets of the European Green Deal, especially in the debate on uh, subsidies to fossil fuels versus renewables and energy efficiency? Yes, indeed, Simone. I think we have a, a full set of instruments available in front of us. And as we know that the decision-making process is always very complex inside a single government, inside Europe with 28 members or 28 minus one or plus three very soon, uh, and uh, internally all the stakeholders, organizations uh, and networks that, that we have. And obviously taxation is a very delicate issue and uh, people do not like uh, very often to pay taxes, but as environmental economists would always said, but we have to pay some taxes, so better base them on environment uh, starting from climate than uh, uh, paying them on our labor, on our income from our work. Uh, so my first reflection would be we should try to use all the instruments and advance in the debate because we don't know where the decision-making final results will come out. 
We are talking about carbon taxes. Some countries in Europe have adopted them. We are talking about ETS markets with all the fantastic intellectual and practical uh, building of markets where they did not exist at the same time with the limits of ETS markets and of the uh, price signal. But as we have worked and learned together, for example, at OECD for many years, we have also a role of excise taxes. And this is why, for example, the energy tax directive revision, which is coming back finally in the European agenda, the former Commission had forgotten it for political reasons, uh, this is a very important tool where we have to, to work together. At the same time, we should uh, uh, keep in mind this idea of uh, European Union own resources. This might be a possibility to introduce a common uh, carbon tax. And at the end of the day, I must say, I'm still very surprised after uh, 40 years after the, the, the petrol oil crisis of the 70s, uh, that the emirs, sultans and oil producers around the world are very often influencing our decisions uh, at European level in our countries having more impact. Uh, we have a decrease in international price of oil and other uh, petrol products. Uh, the <coughs> gasoline and diesel at the pump in these months are down by 30, 40, 50 cents per liter. And uh, many of our countries are deciding and discussing about plus one cent or minus one cent in trying to finalizing things. We have a very strong incentive to increase uh, 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 diesel and, uh, and oil cars and uh, not to introduce innovation in these sectors. Uh, my second point would be, as you mentioned, Simone, about uh, the, the subsidies. Uh, some of our countries have started to prepare catalogs, inventories of environmentally harmful subsidies, and obviously fossil fuel subsidies are the most important part of that. I can see them in France, in uh, Germany, in Italy, uh, in Finland. And I, I think in this we can contribute wherever we are, uh, as civil servants or at university, we can contribute to the public debate with this kind of analysis. In Italy, we estimated that we have uh, 19 billion euros of uh, <coughs> environmentally harmful subsidies, uh, 16 of them being fossil fuel subsidies. There is also the approach from the biodiversity harmful subsidy side, which is strong with the Aichi targets and now the renewal of uh, uh, global UN biodiversity strategies in removing the biodiversity harmful subsidies, and most of them are also harmful to climate, so it might help us. Uh, I would like to add that there are a number of international uh, initiatives, global initiatives, which are important, the coalition of ministers uh, uh, for climate action. Obviously, we have to convince our finance ministers to support environmentally oriented policies. We have uh, commitments by the G7 and G20 with all the political problems of implementation. We've worked hard at OECD in trying to identify fossil fuel subsidies and environmentally harmful subsidies in a frame of green uh, fiscal reform. The recent report by IRENA, the International Renewable Energies uh, uh, Agency based in Abu Dhabi, are very interesting. They were mentioned earlier because the cost of renewables, of investment in renewables, or decreasing rapidly, and uh, the, the contribution of renewables has become a reality. This is very important. But uh, to conclude, uh, obviously, the European dimension is key, even if the uh, European Union budget remains very low. It's to 1%. It might decrease maybe to 2% with the crisis of the pandemics, uh, but uh, uh, it's still very symbolic. It gives a good example. Uh, we have and we have a responsibility to act at national level, but obviously if we do it together at European level, maybe not all together, but a large number of countries all together, things are going to be easier, especially on carbon pricing. And trying to contribute to the question by Alexander Stubb, I remain personally convinced that we have a problem with technological innovation, which is obviously very welcome and needed, but we're not sure then of the timing. Of, intellect, of technological innovation. We're not sure when it will arrive, even if we spend uh, one euro or one billion euro. Uh, will it come next year, in 10 years, in 50 years? Will, will it be in time with the climate uh, challenge? So we have to work on both sides at the same time, helping technological innovation, using targets and regulation, and among these, obviously, a uh, strong, uh, tough carbon price. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Aldo, and I, I think you are right in putting the emphasis on the fact that 
subsidies as well as taxes need to be very well directed to to a good purpose and 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 the more we can guide that uh, review into the european perspective and acting together i think uh, you you make a right point implementation is at the national level uh, but uh, important orientation can be and should be given at the european level so thank you very much aldo our next intervention is from andrea tilke Andrea is uh, a former colleague of mine at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, and uh, he is very much involved in research, as you know. So um, the obvious question to Andrea is where should the EU prioritize uh, to face the challenges of the Green Deal and the post-COVID uh, situation? So Andrea, um, the floor is yours, and happy to see you on the screen. Happy to see you, Joss. Uh, and uh, I have uh, shared with all uh, participants uh, my more recent CV because, uh, as you see, I am also a pensioner of the European Commission now since a couple of years, and I work at the university. And uh, but uh, I shared through the chat. Uh, but uh, at the end of 2018, um, uh, the high-level panel on decarbonization that I have convened that was chaired by John Schellnuber, has uh, sketched a sort of uh, research program in its final report, uh, this, uh, this book, uh, and uh, a, a, a research program that was complex and very uh, articulated uh, with a lot of uh, lines that went together towards uh, 2050 to get uh, uh, full decarbonization uh, in place. And, uh, uh, the, this was, uh, I hope, also uh, one of the sources of inspiration for the Green Deal. Uh, among the main uh, framework recommendations that we put uh, um, for a, a research and innovation agenda, I just mentioned a few of them. First of all, to give priority to zero carbon solutions, not to, to leave the low carbon out. Le low carbon is the past. Zero carbon is the future, and research has to look into the future. Emphasize, second point, the system level innovation and focus research and innovation uh, investments in the high added value segments of value chains is where Europe can better position itself. And then also connecting to the geopolitical considerations, very interesting ones that were made by Alexander Stapp, to engage in smart international cooperation, thinking to position Europe within international value chains. And then uh, the conclusion of this report uh, uh, were that from a technological viewpoint, the, the, for full decarbonization, in most cases, the elements are there already. In many cases, it, it's just a matter of improving the economics of some technologies, uh, residual improvement. It's a matter, of course, of uh, deciding on investments and on the integration of the integration of various elements uh, through governance and digitalization that has to become a pervasive uh, element. However, there are still some relevant sectors that require technological breakthroughs. I mentioned freight transport, uh, aviation, shipping, the change uh, to renewable feedstocks of the chemical industry, huge problem. Zero emission processes for steel production and cement uh, uh, or their substitution. Unfortunately, on some of these key technological changes, I still see around a lot of greenwashing and uh, there are very strong incumbents here in this uh, domain and in Europe in particular, and that they try to set the agenda. And we, we have to be attentive because the agenda is important to be set uh, on the right objectives. But full decarbonization will be impossible without behavioral changes, not only for the dietary dimension, but uh, for our consumption habits in general and for our investment attitudes being private uh, or company uh, uh, act activities. And this makes the socioeconomic research so important for the future. More and more, and this connects with the pandemic uh, crisis, 
it is clear in my view that it is not just a matter of technological fixes. We will not come out of this crisis through that. A deep cultural change in relation to our relationship with the natural resource and planetary boundaries is necessary. And this has to start from educational institutions first. And I see a very, very important role of universities in this case. We have to change education and to start really deeply in, uh, investing in that to produce the massive uh, need of uh, human resources that have to put forward the Green Deal in the next uh, 20 to 30 years in order to achieve truly a, 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 a clear change in Europe and worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for reminding us of the priorities and also be so frank, to be honest, on the, on the risk of green washings and uh, speaking clearly about this change of mindset we were uh, talking about from low carbon to zero carbon. I, I really enjoy this message. I pass on to Thomas Turner. Actually, we, we forgot you, but I'm joking. It was just a mistake of mine in the, in the list, Thomas. Thomas, uh, as you know, is a professor at the uh, University of Gothenburg, very well known in our uh, association for the past presidency as well, and organization of very nice uh, um, events in the past. And uh, Thomas, I, I read one article from you uh, during the, the lockdown, let's say that the toughest part of the lockdown, which I enjoyed really very much. I think it was on the Financial Times. And uh, I would like uh, to have your view on how to redesign economic policy in the post-COVID period. Uh, maybe from your so-called Schumpeterian viewpoint that you were advancing in that article. Hi, thanks. Um, nice to see everybody. I'd like to start with Alexander Stubbs' question. And I think that the, the COVID crisis shows us we don't want a base carbon through output production only. I think we really want a lot of technical progress. Either way, the best instrument to get both technical progress and behavioral change is carbon pricing. I really want to emphasize this. Pricing carbon, pricing, in fact, all, all climate emissions, including methane and others, is our best instrument. Now, the best counter argument of our opponents of the climate, anti climate um, lobbies, is the distributional argument. It is a brilliant argument from their point of view because we are do gooders, liberals in the American sense of the word. We want to improve the world, we don't want to hurt the poor. And so we get very upset at the suggestion that maybe our policies are bad for the poor. However, uh, some of us, and quite a few of us, have spent time looking at the distributional effects. And it's actually hard to find any strong, serious evidence in most countries that, uh, that um, carbon taxes, and in particular fuel taxes that are often uh, the sort of the flashpoint of this debate, that they really do have strong um, negative distributional effects. In low-income countries, they are luxury taxes because it is the rich who use fossil fuels. In most European countries, the taxes are rather neutral. Of course, there is always someone who is affected, and those people will speak up, and sometimes they are connected to the the um, transport industry. Um, I think it's much more important to understand that there is a background of dramatically increasing inequity in society in general. And in fact, compared to the increasing inequity that we see and the sort of the rise of the 1% society, the unfairnesses related to fossil fuels are minute. But the trouble is that they come at a moment when distributional issues are so sensitive politically. 
and therefore this acquires an enormous symbolic effect. Um, and we need to be careful in, in looking, you know, in detail in, in, in the design of policies. But I think a more important issue is really the lack of understanding of how carbon taxes work. People think that the purpose of carbon taxes is to uh, collect money for the state. If the state uses this to insulate houses and put solar cells into the electricity system, then they think, okay, maybe that's good for the climate. If the money goes to the treasury, they think it's lost, and this is not a climate instrument. This is a lack of understanding of our main Pigouvian instruments. People do not think that it will affect their behavior. And the funny thing is that in the very short run, they are correct, because the adjustments that we are looking for take quite a, a number of years to take place when people change vehicles, when they change their habits, when they change uh, uh, work patterns and travel patterns and so on. Um, so I think we should consider all the instruments we can find um, to, um, to explain better how carbon pricing works, first of all, and why it's necessary. That has not been done, and notably was not done very well, I think, by, by the French government. Um, it's also important um, to introduce some earmarking. Earmarking makes the policy, it is a loss of efficiency, of course, we, we know that as economists. Uh, on the other hand, the next 20 years, we are going to spend an enormous amount of public money anyway on climate-related tasks, so that um, visibly creating a certain amount of earmarking it maybe helps explain how this is important for the climate. And it's a small loss of, uh, of efficiency and a big gain in political acceptability. So I think that's one thing we need to consider, in addition, of course, to, to thinking about uh, distributional issues broadly, not just in related to, to fossil prices, but in relation to the whole tax system. Um, I'll end by saying that, of course, the, the collapse of fossil prices currently is a great opportunity uh, to introduce fossil taxes. And interestingly enough, the Indian government, for instance, has done this. Maybe they didn't do it for the reasons that I would have suggested it, that is to affect consumption of fossil fuels, but, maybe, but, but they need money. Uh, in poor countries, the COVID crisis has created a, a tremendous um, collapse of the fiscal space and countries are looking for, for new things, new sources of tax. So I think it, it, in several ways, this is a great opportunity to increase um, carbon taxation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Thomas. And I, I'm very pleased that you are making uh, this argument. Uh, in fact, you, you all remember that last year we made a statement uh, to, this, to the conference that was uh, by hundreds of colleagues uh, signed up. Uh, but you are rightly pointing out, Thomas, that the design of carbon pricing is a very important issue related to the acceptability in the public uh, atmosphere. So uh, thanks for, for that comment. And we come to the last intervention of uh, today. And the last intervention is going to be made by Herman Volleberg, who is Professor of Economics and Environmental Policy at Tilburg University. And um, Herman is, uh, has done a lot of uh, work on effective tax rates across countries, users, and fuels. Uh, so, um, Herman, very eager to have your views also, because this debate is coming back. Uh, think about uh, the border adjustment scheme that has been mentioned already, and that may come up again. So, Herman, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Jos, for um, being here and participating in this very interesting uh, session. I I think if we have been listening to the, so I'm, I'm not going to say so much on the taxation issue, but I, I will end up with a remark on the on the border adjustments. Um, but listening and looking at the Green Deal discussion, um, we see that uh, the Commission has taken a very broad 
uh, perspective, um, uh, taking in uh, many different directives and also optimizing, I would say, in looking at these directives in how they could contribute to the, uh, to the uh, let's say, the CO2 reduction emissions over time. And I think that's the right approach. We should not talk about only one instrument. We really should look at a whole bunch of instruments. And not only that, I will claim also that uh, policy coherence is, is requiring even more. Uh, I was asked to say something about competition policy, for instance, and innovation policy. And I think the competition issue is a widely neglected area in environmental economics. And that's not an, an even uh, outside of it. Whereas it is a really a serious issue. So I think that the current competition law is not very well suited and may even uh, pose some uh, barriers to, uh, to the, all the uh, ambitious plans that are uh, around the corner. I have some experience now with the Dutch uh, uh, competition authority because they, they really think that they have a problem because the current law is just uh, directing them towards the lowest price and collusion of course uh, requires, um, uh, of the, the, let's say, the, the criterion to judge uh, interventions and collusions is usually based on the lowest price. Uh, and whereas we all know that, um, let's say, everything you do in uh, environmental economics is, uh, is looking at externalities that exist, which imply that the current prices are too low, in a sense, and that they should be raised, and we're talking about carbon taxes as an example, but there are many more examples, uh, but if you, uh, at the competition authority, should and you really look at this kind of uh, uh, policies and you only look at their at the lowest price as a criterion you really have a problem so i think there's a lot to be done also in that area the, the same holds for state aid i think state aid rules also need to uh, to be checked uh, in in this respect um on the innovation uh, side i i have a bit uh, the same feeling i i don't feel very uh, very well about the idea of of a general uh, idea of that innovation would be good for society. I think we have seen the opposite uh, many times. We also have seen uh, uh, in, indeed good types of innovation, but the key issue is that we need directed technological change. And, and then the question of obviously is, uh, how do you direct technological change? And uh, I think the work of, uh, of um, Antoine de Chele Petra and also my own work points out that there is a close interaction between policy instruments, being subsidies, standards, or even taxes, and the, the, the reaction by the different players in, uh, in society. And I mentioned two examples from the Dutch case. So we have here an, a very interesting discussion with industry. Uh, as you may know, the Netherlands has a very uh, big, uh, like Belgium, by the way, has a very big uh, um, uh, sector in, in terms of, uh, of using fossil fuels and makes it very uh, complicated to uh, to steer towards these uh, ambitious plans for 2030 and even 2050. But the interesting thing is that the ETS price has risen so much uh, that uh, carbon abatement technologies become interesting for them. And we should really look at the way in which we have designed ETS. I think there was already a mention of, uh, of, of, uh, of including the, the removal aspect into ETS. But I would also say that we need also more complicated assessments of, uh, of let's say, industrial uh, collusion. Because what we see in chemical industry, for instance, in the basic industry, is that these are widely uh, uh, industries working in networks. And it's very difficult for them sometimes to improve, for instance, in terms of hydrogen e economic options, to, uh, uh, to make a case and, and earn, in a sense, uh, the right type of investment decisions. So a taxonomy is fine, that will work, that gives some direction, but more is needed. The, the policy packages should also be directed in a way that these industries can indeed uh, benefit, in a sense, in, their, in making their investment decisions. And we can do that. We have seen that in the electricity sector. I think uh, if you look at the ETS and the success of ETS is mainly electricity. Now the next step is industry. And there are huge ideas, innovative options are already around. We don't need to wait for them. They are there. The key issue is to have the right incentive. Now then, uh, as a final point on the, because nobody has uh, in the end said anything on the carbon uh, uh, border adjustments, I think they, they really are necessary, but only where they are necessary. And that's not a very big part of the economy. In terms of CO2, yes, it's very large. That is again, uh, industrial sectors which operate in an international uh, area like the steel industry or the chemical industry. 
they face already big challenges uh, like the shale gas, uh, which is now of course reversed because of the COVID crisis. So we should be careful in looking at that. Um, but I think that um, the main idea would be to link this carbon uh, border adjustments to coalition building. Uh, if we cannot use them to build coalitions in a smart way, um, then we may be hesitant to apply them given the changes uh, in the political structure we, uh, on which Alexander Stubbe had a very wonderful talk, in my view. Um, I would leave it there. Thank you, Herman. Thank you for basically answering Alex's question uh, uh, that provoked quite a debate uh, today, but also my provocative, uh, intentionally provocative question on, on border adjustment. Uh, I think we arrive uh, to, to the end and uh, uh, I really learned a lot from all your interventions. Uh, just, me, just let me say one thing behind the scenes in the uh, Zoom webinar chat, the discussion among us has already started and this reminds me of what happened with our previous uh, policy outreach committee event on May 7, when the discussion actually went on till late at night and the following morning, just as you remember. So this is a real great sign of uh, activity, of enthusiasm from all policy outreach committee members uh, and also their enthusiastic reply to my proposal of participating to this session uh, was uh, flattering and really gives a lot of, of energy. And uh, we want to use this energy to keep doing things in uh, 2021 because uh, in 2020 it seems uh, difficult to meet personally and I do hope that we will manage to, to meet in person next time but in any case we will bring our policy discussion uh, forward within the committee. So I would like to pass on to Jos for the closing remarks. Thank you Simone and uh, thank you very much. This was indeed a very rich discussion also, the introductions, I think, were opening up uh, the scope of our debate. And I, I always like to leave such a discussion with uh, a few key points that I took away. And uh, let me make five key points that I took away from the discussion. Uh, the first is that uh, it was made very clear by Alex and Peter and by Echo by so many that climate change, as much as COVID, is a global problem and that we are acting in Europe in a geopolitical context. And that means we are not on our own. We have a lot to do ourselves, uh, but we are in a game where the US is an actor, China is becoming an actor. And I think the um, remarks that were made by Otmar about the role of coal brings us down to earth. It's not only about renewables, it's not only about the new technologies we are setting in the market, but what are the others doing? And I think <clears throat> that this coal question is a very important one that uh, needs to be very much uh, coal and lignite and let's say very intensive fossil fuels. And related to that, perhaps the question on the border measures. I, I, I took uh, Herman's words uh, and also implicitly Otmar's words is we should talk to the rest of the world. We should build coalitions and not uh, jump to the sanctions uh, simply because it may lead to retaliation, as we all know, we are an exporting continent. And uh, so that's the first cluster of things on, around which I think we had a very good discussion and perspectives for future action. Uh, the second question uh, or element that I take away is what Thomas said on carbon pricing. Uh, whether it is taxes or ETSs, um, uh, carbon pricing, the statement that we made last year, remains very relevant and it remains very relevant also for other parts of the world. In fact, uh, at the EUI, together with Simone at the School of International Governance, we are preaching the gospel of carbon pricing to emerging uh, G20 economies. And um, I think Thomas was right in indicating that the way it is being done is very important. Uh, taxes um, raise revenue. And so what happens with the revenue is a very important question. So uh, earmarking revenues, uh, it was uh, a little bit surprising to hear it from uh, Thomas because economists are normally uh, not very fond of earmarking uh, revenues, but I fully agree. Uh, it is also uh, creating the support for these uh, green taxes 
Otherwise, people say, uh, wh where is this money going? Is it to finance uh, military equipment or anything like that? So I think carbon pricing, very important. We have to keep saying it, and we have a good point there. And we are doing well on that in Europe, as Herman was reminding us, we are having, even in the COVID crisis, a price of 25 euros. element, I think that many made the point on the social impact, uh, the just transition fund in Europe, but also, you know, covering the employment effects, the distribution effects, uh, the gilet jaune phenomenon on which uh, we have to uh, find answers, uh, partly is in the design of carbon pricing, but also the just transition fund is a fund. Uh, part of the revenues from the ETS are going to be used to finance investment in one of the other area, in particular in coal mining areas. The fourth element is that many of you said um, that the circular economy, it's a wider context, it's economic policy, it's innovation policy, it's finance, uh, so it's a wider area. And uh, the German minister uh, Schulz this morning was putting that in the right perspective. And I think that's hopeful for the German presidency that is about to start in a couple of weeks. And my final uh, word is, I, I can't resist uh, uh, being reminded of having been a policymaker for too long time. It's good to have the long term, the climate neutrality, the 2050, but it's also very important to have a very operational timescale. And it, I think it was Peter who said that 2030 remains very important and the discussion on those targets uh, are going to be on in, in a couple of uh, uh, months. And so an operational target helps to put into place the policies uh, that we need. So I, I enjoyed the discussion very much. We had lots of speakers. Uh, we had a, an excellent set of interventions by Alex Stoop and Peter Viss. Uh, and uh, I was uh, equally charmed by so many interventions that in the end makes clear that economists have a good story to tell when it comes to environmental slash climate policy making for the future. And as Simone was uh, saying, uh, there is more appetite to continue the good work. So we will uh, develop a work program, Simone and myself, come back to you for next year, and we will be in touch uh, shortly. So I would like to hand over again to the organizers with a little apology. Uh, we started 15 minutes late, uh, we ended 25 minutes late. Uh, so uh, we are still in, in the range, I hope, of what is acceptable. And I would like to thank you all for a very inspiring morning in which I enjoyed the discussion and I hope you did as well. Thank you and goodbye. See you.